Welcome to the Warren Cycling Podcast. My name is Dean Warren. I'm in Milan, Italy today. And I'm Randy Warren, and I'm in Niles, Michigan. Yeah, it's both different places for us. It's episode 352 of the Warren Cycling Podcast. It's April 17th, Flesh Vallon Day, Tour of the Alps Stage 3 Day. And wow, I can't believe with Flesh Vallon that it's only like just one more really of the spring cla- you know, classic races. Our Den Classics closing up. I mean, with Lesh, Best on Lesh coming up this weekend. Uh, wow, these big one day races are going to be behind us. Uh, well, you know, I guess we got some pretty good stuff coming up with the Giro d'Italia starting a little over two and a half weeks, the uh, Tour of Romandy and the, the women's um, Giro, well, Tour of Volta Espana, I guess you would call it, uh, coming up pretty soon as well. So, yeah, we got lots of, I mean, I like the one day races and there's lots of races to to see um not quite daily now but yeah when those grand tour starts every day except for the rest yeah. days is a little downer every day you got a stage and <laughs> different different um storylines so that that's fun to keep up with but um yeah I, I came over here on a trip I, I had plans to rent a bike and try to ride some of the lombardia route but it, it just it didn't work out the place wasn't as close to where I thought it was it was in a different train station than they said that the tracks were under repair and I'd have to take a bus I thought it would take longer then a colleague wanted to come with me so then I was like oh, okay I'll just do it another time and we talked to the tourist office and they were saying oh that yeah the road that I was going to ride up toward Bellagio and then cut over to the course is not very good for riding there's a lot of traffic but but then she did say on the weekends that there's a lot of cyclists out on the weekends. So they, I guess the cyclists take over maybe the roads more on the weekends. It would be maybe better then. So I uh, have a chance maybe to come back and do that. But um, yeah, it's a beautiful area, Lake Como area. And I can see why the Giro de Lombard. And I was looking at the climb. I, I mapped out like a 60 mile. I thought, okay, well, maybe I can do 60 miles because um, I had to get the bike back by a certain time. But then it said it would be like 6,000 feet of climbing. Wow. Yeah, I was like, wow, there, there was a couple of pretty, you know, nothing super big climbs, but enough climbing. And I thought, ooh, I don't know, that, <laughs> that was going to be pretty, pretty difficult. That's a t- typical Asheville ride, 6,000 feet of climbing over 60 miles. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and my legs are, I, I don't know, I guess my cycling legs maybe are okay, but my hiking legs, I did a big hike on my layover in South Korea over the weekend. I did like over 4,600 feet of elevation gain hiking. Oh. For how, so, long, how many miles did you? I did you 11 hike? miles, and my legs have been so sore. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I don't use my hiking legs that much, but I'm like, yeah, oh, man. Like, up and down. Yeah, like, up and down both. Yeah, yeah, so now every time I stand up, it's like, oh man, <laughs> we're going downstairs. Oh, I, I felt That's like a good this. Feeling, after. though, I think. Don't you think? I mean, doesn't it feel good in some ways to be sore? Because it's, it's like, I, I can know, like once I get like, moving, like, but the first the first steps are a little, <laughs> a little tough. Yeah. Well, it's not like um, an injury. So, like my Achilles no. injured for like six weeks now or seven weeks, yeah, and it still hurts a lot. So I, so I, it just I mean, every time it hurts, it's like ah, it hasn't healed yet, you know. Yeah, yeah. But if you're sore, you know that in a day or two you won't be sore anymore. And so it's for me, it always feels like I know it's building. I'm on day day stronger. four though, I think already. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I was thinking too, because I I walked like I did I don't know six over sixteen thousand steps today, so it was. Pretty, pretty good amount of walking, but yeah. Not like a massive day. But we're but talking, solid. no, but it's good, yeah. No, I'll hopefully be stronger for my next hike. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, a, for us on, on a vacation day where we walk a lot, like in New York City, we hit around 30,000 steps, I think, so. Oof. Yeah, 26 to 30, I think, so that's yeah. that's like an all-day exploring the city kind of thing. Sure. That's a big day, though, walking. Yeah. For sure, we get tired. Yeah. Well, my Garmin's been telling me I've been overreaching lately, so I think maybe I need to. <laughs> I don't have a whoop. I, I was thinking to get the whoop for a few months just to kind of get a basis of what it feels like, what the whoop says, and what it feels like just to kind of confirm, because you got to pay that subscription, right? Yeah. It's like, There's a subscription. Yeah. yeah, it is different, too, because during my gravel camp, which we just finished last Sunday, you know, the the um, whoop goes by biometrics, including heart rate, but I think also some of the other things. But Strava goes by purely heart rate for your Strava stress score. And then your TSS score is purely based on your power. So there was one day where I had almost no work on my 
my heart rate, my strong score was like, you, you barely work today. But my power was really significant, you know. So I had done a lot of power, but my body was tired, so my heart rate just wasn't really responding. And then the whoop, um, one day when I was really low on the TSS score, really low on my Strava score, and then almost maxed out my whoop score. <laughs> so it's like all, all well, whoop, whoop takes in the sleep factor too, right? How not for the have? stress. I mean, no. it does give you in terms of recovery score, it mm -hmm. includes your sleep. But in terms of the amount of stress you have, I thought it was mostly purely heart rate, but then that wouldn't correspond with the Strava stuff, although the whoops all day long. But it showed specifically the cycling had a super high score, like 20.6 or something like that, which is almost maxed out. And my Strava score was like 100 or something like that. It was like it was relatively small. So it didn't work, yeah. they both couldn't, if they're both doing heart rate, they're interpreting that data differently. So I'm not sure if the whoop does other biometrics, like maybe blood flow or something too is it a heart rate or i'm not sure but yeah so but my point is though is that if you got the data it would give you some data but maybe it would enlighten your garmin data some but at the same time is that they are using well, the don't, data don't, differently. don't you measure that against how you actually feel then too well that's another yeah metric too so normally i always say there's three there's like the you know, perceived rate of exertion, your heart rate response, and your power output, like during a ride, to, to, to you know, three considerations in terms of how you're working out and effect it's having on your body and stuff like that. But then the whoop, you know, is another, is another factor too, in terms of like different things too. So yeah, so I, I have a, you know, I, I have an index of how I feel, and then also my TSS score, my Strava score, and then my whoop score. So I guess it's four different metrics I'm using and when they all line together, it's great. You know, like you have a high TSS, high Strava score, you know, you felt like you worked hard and then your whoop gives you a high score. That's great. But when they're really divergent, like it was for me at Gravel Camp, I mean, really divergent. <laughs> like one saying I worked as hard as you possibly could work and everyone's saying it was an active recovery day. <laughs> you know, that's, it's yeah. so diver divergent that, yeah, then it's harder, you know, you got to almost throw out some of the data because you know, I knew I was tired, but I knew I was working, I was riding with one of my athletes and so it was a little bit, um, easy ride for me because I was staying with them, but still I was tired from the day before. So then my heart rate response is going to be lower, you know, so it's, it's not, it's never easy. So that's one of the things too, again, in the coaching circles, we talk a lot about AI and how it's going to, some people say take over coaching and stuff too. But if you strictly try to analyze the data through AI or just even just look at the data, it would be so confusing. I'm sure AI couldn't really do much with it. It'd have to discount some data, or if it used all the data, it wouldn't really make sense to it. So yeah, that's why again you have to kind of look and see, you know, what was, you know, how you feel, but what also what were you doing, what was your goal for that day in terms of how you're trying to ride, what your day was like beforehand, the day beforehand, that kind of stuff too. So it's, it's yeah, it's it's all it's all numbers and they can be helpful, but nothing's definitive. Yeah, do you feel like you can be pretty honest with yourself or I mean you're a pretty positive person and kind <laughs> of I mean do you have to really like put yourself in check like how how do I really like am I like wanting how I feel or how I really do feel or or am I being too hard on myself or which I mean how do you uh do you turn my subjective yeah I'm pretty yeah. objective I think with my subjective feelings about things well, especially you know <laughs> you have to so, be subjective about your objective yeah, yeah. Well, I'm pretty objective about my subjective feeling. Yeah, exactly. Well, because I still feel like there's something wrong with me from Italy. So whatever happened to that virus in Italy, I, I know I know how my body feels. I know how it should feel or does normally feels when I work really hard. And, and I'm definitely not right still. So, um, but yeah, it, walking around, I feel fine. And, and I can ride long distances and I'm fine. And I can work pretty hard, but not as hard as I normally would be able to so that's kind of a weird thing so in my objective subjective feeling i have to be like you know it, you know my legs hurt a lot more than they usually hurt when i'm doing like a long hard climb and which is just weird for me because normally they don't hurt like that but right now they are so i'm not sure if there's like oxygen uptake that's going on and my doctor's like i don't know i think you had a virus <laughs> so i'm gonna have to do some of my own research on things too but yeah i think i can generally say you know I can, I can contextualize how I feel. So like during gravel camp, one day I went really hard but during the during the day. Like I, I you know, and I, and I, towards the end of the ride, it almost seemed like I was bonking because I was having a trouble time keeping up with the, a couple of the fastest guys. 
but I wasn't walking though. I mean, I, I had enough energy. I mean, I was eating right and stuff too. It was just my legs were really tired. And so that was different for me. <laughs> and and uh, especially, you know, normally I would have been able to be one of the strongest, if not the strongest riders and I'm not. So you have to be honest with yourself, you know, I'm not sure what's going yeah. on. But, so yeah. let, let's, let's maybe turn this into what we usually talk about is professional racing and the big favorite didn't perform so well and kind of almost a little bit miffed and waiting for Matteo Vanderpool to um, bridge up to those guys that were ahead of him because it, they weren't that far ahead. And he's usually able to do that pretty easily. I mean, his team was pretty whittled down. They didn't have, he didn't have much support, but it wasn't so far from the end. And I mean, he soloed from that far before with a lot of power and he, he just, that uh, you know he didn't have the, such great legs. I mean, even Matteo Vanderpool without such great legs is probably still on par with most every other rider. <laughs> well, you didn't. Though, we've seen though, <laughs> we've seen him not be great though at yeah. other time. Wait, wait, and he wait, was wait, great wait. for those two weeks too. So I think that's one thing too is that if he had not been flying, you know, like like I've not been flying fast since I caught that virus, you know. So if I had really good weeks, I was flying fast, and I had bad weeks you know, then I had to figure out why that was, you know, too, and there'd be a different problem. So for him, you know, he could be, he was really peaking for those weeks. He was really super motivated for those weeks, you know, to do the double and and he did really well, you know, he succeeded beyond all expectations for those two weeks and stuff too. So then this week is not as important of a race and no matter how much he tries to get himself up to it, he's also like, ah, you know, he, he said, openly said, these aren't the races that are best for my type of rider. And so He's got a little bit of a mental block already about that. And then, like you said, his team wasn't there to really give him the best support that he had in, in, in you know, Flanders and Roubaix. And so um, the combination of things puts him in a position where, you know, he's not going to make those extra moves maybe. And maybe just doesn't feel quite as good too. But he performed so well too that there wasn't the same kind of motivation and pressure and stuff like that to do well too. So um, so he's that's a really different situation. But I think that, you have to know sometimes too. You just don't have the legs, and it was just why you're doing the double is so hard, right? I mean, nobody since Fabio, Fabio Cancellara was the last person to do it, and um, it's just a hard thing to do, even if you're flying fast during but that one week period of time, you know, start to finish, to have those magic legs or the no chain or you know the the, the feeling like you're able to take on the world like that too. You know, we so we say ah, oh, he's gonna dominate for years like this, but. Maybe never again. You don't know, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's nothing's. Well, well, it's not a formula. I mean, it is a I formula. Think, but it's think, not like, you know, A plus B equals C all the times. On one level, it's it's almost encouraging to other racers and fans to see that he's human. You know, that he's not doing something that's superhuman. That he's not infallible. But uh, also, I wonder too. They, kind of was hinting at or saying that it was more for him to train and prepare for the edge, best on the edge, which I don't know how it's not as big a goal, of course, as Flanders and Roubaix, but still pretty high goal. But if he's already dipping after peaking, you know, maybe can keep or, that level. Yeah. I don't know. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. I mean, right. it's going to be Teddy Pagatza racing that says he's feeling pretty good. So yeah. it's, it's going to be definitely another fascinating and fun race. And, and I just hope, well, I don't know. The, I mean, the weather played definitely a big role today at Flesh Ballon. Yeah. Um, we've got both the winners um, and the men's and the women on our screen shots behind us. Um, I mean, what do you say, 44 riders only finished? 44, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a pretty small number. Um, they did four ascents up to Mordehui, which is the most they've done before. And, and yeah, Steve Williams, Stephen Williams of Israel Premier Tech, so not a World Tour team winner, which... You know, you, you, all these big budget teams, and you see where Alpes and de Koenig takes, you know, three monuments right. as not being one of the top big budget teams, and then Israel Tech takes this win, and and I guess um, maybe over the weekend with Ineos Grenadiers, who used to dominate, win all kinds of races left and right, yeah. um, <laughs> getting this, a, this a big win. I think they said their fourth win of the year too, so they've been. Well, Steve Wills won 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 the um, overall at Tour Down Under, right? Yeah. yeah, and he was flying, flying, flying. And then he and won he the first got, stage of the Catalonia Tour, didn't he? Did he get sick or something, though, too, after that or something? Something happened to him, I think. 
Yeah. So yeah. that's that, yeah. that's. I mean, that's good to see. That's good for something. Yeah. It's good for different it's, winners. Tom Pitcock, you think already? Wow, he's such a big. It's only his fifth win. I mean, he's, he's had Alvarez and Stravian like huge wins before, but he's done. You know, hasn't yeah. been a prolific winner. No, um, but he's also Olympic and world champion. Like, and and world champion yeah. and cyclocross Olympic yeah. champion. Yeah. So he's got. Um, you know, really big wins across different disciplines as well. But yeah, it was a great win for him, especially too, since a couple of years ago, um, right, riding a difficult situation where it appeared that he won against Bob Van Aert on that. Um, he toyed with that in the interview too. So, after yeah. He said, I, yeah. I'd like, to, I'd like to say I, it's, it's nice to have my second win here, but I <laughs> said I might upset some people if I say that. <laughs> so, right. so he said it anyway, in a, just in a way not to... <laughs> Which is weird because I, I had to think, but I, I try to remember the details, you know. So my understanding was that the photo was not definitive, right? When well, it was, the, the, the where, where it was set up, but not in the right place, the camera, yeah. I think. Yeah. So, so so that was a situation where where they say clearly the rules state that the photo is definitive, <coughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> they, they were able to, they didn't have the opportunity for it to be definitive, so they kind of had to like guess <laughs> who won the race in a super close finish. And so, yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, so, uh, you know, ni nice win there. Um, Tesh Banut was on the podium, right? He was third. Third, I think, yeah. Real quick, I want to mention, Eleanor Bagstead was the last place finisher today in the in women's. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, so a lot more. A lot more. But yeah. just, it got really cold. It rained really hard. It said it snowed. There's some snow the first time oh, they went yeah. up, so... Yeah, um, difficult race, difficult conditions, but um, yeah, it was, it's nice to see not the same person winning year after year, and especially on the women's side, so to see Cassie Niodomo, who's been chasing after a big win for a long time, I guess. 2019. I guess, yeah. yeah, the Tour of London, or I mean, yeah, it was, yeah, it's been a while she, for her. So, yeah, it was great, great, great for her to win. I was, and we're jumping all over the place like we do sometimes, but, but it was nice to see Mark Hershey rise so oh, strongly. He, so he was second. He was second. And, and, yeah. yeah, and apparently he's the one that made the selection on the yeah. penultimate climb. So, right. no, he's you know. He's trying really well, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's only 25, but he's been around for a long time, so. Well, it's because like, you know, he had those you know, big uh, Tour de France wins a few years ago, so he was already yeah. big breakout wins and, and not followed it up with a lot more wins since then so it makes you feel like it's been a while and he's still got a lot of good years, years ahead of him yeah. yeah yeah but he did win the gc and tour of luxembourg last year so yeah no quality, won, quality yeah. rider and, and he won the festival in 2020 too yeah 20 as well yeah. so yeah. It's, it's he's yeah so it's, it's you know i don't want to say he's having down because he obviously you know he, he won a race this year too the fond de rome classic so he's he's right. and he won last year some races too he's right, been strong strong riding stronger though this year more consistently i think than the past couple of years yeah this is like before we got a win he was not a consistent winner but occasional you know yeah he's having a strong year yeah it was weird though too because is i'd say fewer big names today than what we're used to seeing you know yes and a weird situation too, because like Malcolm Olimo was in the move, um, and, and this is going back to Amstel Cold, sorry, uh, but it, and and they thought he couldn't win the sprint, <laughs> so which no, is true. Didn't like, have a good finish. Yeah, yeah. Sprint. So a little track was actually chasing when he was in the in the move towards the end there too. It's um, Gelmos Gel has a fast finish. Yeah, it's Gelmos yeah. is actually a pretty good finish finish. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kevin Vermarco was the first American. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, 20 24th place. Michael Matthews too was the he won his group sprint 11 seconds back. Um, yeah, so. the groups were not that far behind. No, in the pictures too. Did you see? Well, the fourth yeah. place oh, yeah. sir Van Semmerent, he was leading out the sprint, and they said he probably had the worst sprint of the of the four in the in the lead group, and but he was probably leading it out because he didn't want to get worse than fourth, <laughs> and they're afraid that they. But it was they Paul. Kept, the the Pierre, the, the, the Pierre was French, uh, he, he won the next group. He almost caught yep. Vincent. Yeah, but he was almost bridged up to that front group. Yes. He was just about to catch him, and then right then Pickcock was attacking. So he, he just 
if Pitcock not attacked yet, I think he would have been up there and, and he, maybe he would have podiumed or done better. So you're right though, because so I think what happened, right? The four people finished together. Lapierre finished by himself, and then Madwas finished next in the group, but they're all in the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but they came they came to the line not all together. You know what I mean? Like the, the right, first right. Pickaxe group had been similar, it was the last person in that group. And then the next group, next person was Lapierre, who was basically by himself, but yet also in the same time. And the Madwas was also in the same time, but also in the next group. So, oh, yeah. 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 Now, yeah. There was a lot of regrouping right at the finish. Right at the finish. Yeah. yeah. And ironically, Baka Malama was second in that, that, that group then with Madwas. <laughs> so he actually did okay, you know, and Paul Bilbao, who has got a decent kick on him, actually yeah. was the last guy in the group because I think he, you know. Well, again, motivation plays a lot of a big part of it, too. Right. Well, if we're talking about like someone like Buckle Molema, who's been around a lot riding well, we have to mention at the Tour Alps, which today was stage three today. And yeah. Juan, this is Juan Pedro Lopez on the strat sheet, but listening to him, they say Juan P. Lopez. So maybe he just uses the initial Juan P. That's what I heard him saying on the, on the okay. TV coverage. So he, he won the um, stage today and took over the lead in the Tour of the Alps. But he, he was a former um, pink jersey wearer at the Giro for Legal Trek. And um, what I want to mention, though, was yesterday, it was yesterday, stage two, that's Sandro DeMarchi writing now for Jaco Alula. Yeah. Um, he's won a lot of breakaway, a breakaway solo wins so. over his career. He's kind of like a um, Thomas Agant kind of kind yeah. of writer. Or I kind of see him in that kind of. Uh, but anyway, he's, he's, he's 37, and, he's, and he's, he's a little more of a winner at the end, I think, though. But yeah, yeah, 37, and I mean, you know, winning yeah. that stage, and then Garen Thomas was using it to get ready for the um, Giro. Start out, you know, riding very strongly up there, but I think he suffered. Maybe in the weather was raining there too. It was not good weather. But, but he's um, saying he's in good shape though too. He, he said better shape yeah. than he was last year, which he was leading the Giro to the last day. And he's doing the double too. He's doing the Giro and the Tour this year, right? So, yeah, and he's 37 as well, isn't he? 37 this year? I think so. Tobias Fosso is riding now for Ineos Grenadiers. Got the first stage win, which was you know right after the day after Tom Pickett got the win for Ineos. It was a yeah. already a good week for Ineos um, with a couple wins in different races. Yeah, that was, and that was so I didn't really see that um, stage, but you know you're you're saying it was. People were chasing each other, and it was it was a group of you know eleven almost at the end, but ended up being two groups. So uh, Juan P. Lopez won the group sprint from the chasers, you know that was fifth place, but it was Foss, Harper, Chris Harper, Esteban Chavez, who hasn't done a lot lately, but you know, and then Ben O'Connor, who has done a lot, yeah, yeah, uh, somewhat recently. I mean, Ben O'Connor is you know really the stage race hope for. Decathlon, that's yeah, just yeah. the money sure, sure. Yeah, so it's it's good. I think, and is he doing the Giro? Is O'Connor doing the Giro? I think he, he is. is yes, yes, yes. So that's good Good indicators for him because he's, uh, for sure, you know, sure. I mean, he's a Grand Tour, right, contender. He won a stage of the Giro, won a stage of the Tour. Uh, definitely, you know, I think they're playing. Any, any playing podium, podium. Like one of them? I'm looking to see here real quick on those things. Uh, four, fourth, fourth in GC of the Tour de France. Fourth, Four. okay, close to Yeah, and he was third twice in the in the Criterium de Dauphiné. So second in GC of UAE Tour. <laughs> so this year, so he's you know he's he's um yeah. So I I think that a lot of people are using indicators of of where they're where they're going to be, and so. Yeah, oh, it's Chavez too. I mean, if Chavez is he, he's shown some flashes for sure um, this year, and he's and got not uh, consistency. I don't think. No, not consistency at all. Like, doesn't he does not have any, he doesn't say any what's coming up for his program. So I don't know if he's doing the Giro or not, but um, more than likely, I mean, he's won three stages of the Giro d'Italia, so more than likely that's the role he would play if he's going to the Giro anyway. Uh, probably not. GC leader, but um, you know, the really 2016, he was second in the Giro d'Italia. That was probably the only time he was really gunning for an overall win and a race that big. Um, and at that time, they thought maybe he would continue to be a Grand Tour contender, but it hasn't really worked out that way. Uh, eight years eight ago years. now. Yeah, it's a long time. 
right. All right. Well, we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time, just kind of overlapping all of our coverage. <laughs> well, there's a lot going on too. And yeah, I think sometimes people focus on one event or two events. Like I was just watching the GCN uh, recap um, yesterday, I think, just to prepare for this some too. And they totally just absolutely bold. That was what they totally, you know, focused on. And then at the very end, a little teeny bit about other races that happened. We tend to look more broadly <laughs> than that for sure. I was All looking right. to see if Lily Williams talk about, you know, we cover women's racing more than others, but she did not do uh, the flesh belong. So I don't know if she did. I don't think she did out the the, uh, to the um, Ansel Gold either. No, Ruth uh, Edwards was Edwards. racing. She's raced both. Yeah. 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 Heidi Franz, too. She was in the early break, I think, of Amstel Gold. Was that right? And then she did, ended up being a DNF. But she was, I think, one of the very first breaks uh, Heidi Franz was in, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. So I, I just read that someplace else, too. So, yeah, she did. Yeah, she was a DNF there eventually. But um, showing, you know, so she's racing for. Life plus Wahoo and uh, doing a full European campaign. She's really picked up her game this year, too. Great, great. Well, oh, Veronica, yeah. you're yours. It's another person who's been doing well, too, for you. She's yeah, been racing. She was a lot of best doing. hope, I think, over Flesh Alone, too. Yeah. But um, just real briefly, did you see the NCL in the United States, oh. the um, Crit League? So we lost Joe Martin. Now we lost the Crit Series yeah. this year. Johnny, uh, Red, Redlands Clark. just just happened. Yeah, Johnny Clark was thanking the NCL just for employing. He had a good attitude about it, but a lot of people are like, "What?" You know, they thought this was supposed to be. It was very sudden. It was a four-minute Zoom call and no questions uh, allowed. <laughs> so it was. It was. Yeah. It was. Uh, yeah. It's too bad because they, they didn't have been having any races and they have staff and stuff there too. The Redlands Classic, yeah. So I just talked to Taylor just briefly. I just messaged with him today. Yeah, uh, he got sick. CS Velo got second. Yeah. And, and, and I watched him. Right. Too. He, was, he was fourth and third, then second. I didn't see how he got second, but it must have been in the last stage. Oh, they, yes. they got a bunch. Yeah, they, they got bonus sprint. There was a time sprint, and he won the sprint to get three bonus seconds. So he was right. one second behind second place going into the last day. Yeah, and he only picked up one second or something like that in the time trial, I think, right? And he, and he moved up a spot in that. I mean, it was like, it must have been very, very tightly spaced. So, but Tyler Stites won by you know, 40 okay. seconds. Yeah. Fourth time, third right? time, third time third in time. a row. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Project Echelon they had you know, raced a lot in Europe already, were racing really strongly. And um, yeah, they took another Redlands, which, you know, there's not hardly any races at Redlands and Tour of the Gila. Which is coming up this week or next week? I think next week Taylor says they're going to be there three weeks, so training. Oh. So maybe it's further it's down. Right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, fewer and fewer races, unfortunately, in the United States. Although the a new one coming in the Grand Fondo weekend in New York, the uh, UCI and, race. So and, and then and then, and then they had the Levi Leipheimer. Yeah, I was just going to say that Levi Leipheimer, um, Grawler, like a. 140 mile road race, tons of climbing, like really tough race, which With doesn't of, exist much in the U.S. And a lot of well, like the poor gra too. gravel riders, yeah, yeah. racing yeah. it. It's funny too because now that they're, they're <laughs> apparently, I but they were road riders before most. <laughs> yeah, and and some of them were saying some of them who haven't been road riders are saying, hey, this was fun. It was kind of like a gravel race on road <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on pavement. So, and, they're, and then they're probably now they're coming out with some all road bikes, you know? So instead of saying a gravel bike or an endurance bike, it's an all road bike, rough road and smooth road. So it has more clearance for wider tires and stuff too. And so making it for all paved type surfaces. Mm -hmm. So it, it may be to be a little more exposure to that type of racing, but that was still, yeah, I think $10,000 for the first prize and women's and men's were, just distributed equally just real quick on the redlands classic too I, I i saw a post from brendan rim and he said that his first race was 2016 he was very young he got time cut and he watched sunset from the feed zone and was in, inspired by what a hard race and how fast they went and stuff and then brendan rim won the last yeah, stage, sunset, which was the sunset, yeah. stage yeah so um you know it's good to see that kind of that kind of 
story where you you know you start out and you're get your teeth kicked in and set your sights for more and then you know some eight years later right wins that stage well you see the list of former redlands winners too and you see top americans that have done well in the, in the world tour too so yeah it's a important race very so it's just and like you said so few it's more important now because there's not as many races too so yeah yeah well let's do our birthdays and cut this off um it's getting late here in milan yeah you got anything I, else that we've missed um, on your mind yeah so much. there I, was I, yeah last and half well if i did it yeah so i think we did it too so well i did see that uh, vinda goes out of the hospital so that's good um but that you know much of the Giro and uh, racing right now is being shaped, you know, so Pagata wasn't racing. He didn't get hurt. <laughs> so he's a favorite this weekend and a favorite into the Giro too. So sometimes, sometimes now not racing might be safer than <laughs> the other. And then you said to the movie Hard Miles. I've never heard of it. Oh, I don't think I've heard of it. Um, but it was, uh, it was recommended to you. And I see Velo has yeah. got an article about that too. So uh, when, did, when did it come out a while ago though? I didn't think it was that new of a movie. I didn't read the article, but I saw the, that it was being a, an article about it there, too. So, All right. Uh, well, another cycling movie. It's always good. Yeah. You want to see, because it says, you know, of course, it's getting huge. Matthew Modine, who is apparently a, a well-known actor. <laughs> That's a big what he's done before. But um, they're, they're saying it might be like a breaking away kind of, you know, a feeling to the heart of, because breaking away, I mean, my son Matthew watched it, and he's like, that was a great movie. He's not into sports at all, you know, and he's, He's like, that was, you know, he, he liked it a lot just because of the story. It was really good writing. It won the best screenplay Oscar that year. Um, so if this movie is kind of like that, and towards that, then I think that it could help too. And I really liked um, the movie that Kevin Costner did in... Uh, American uh, Flyers? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, the one he did about cross-country running in Northern California. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I had it my tongue a second ago and I, and I lost it. But that, I like that movie. I thought it was just a good movie. I thought it was I Bakersfield was area. Mm, it's up more north, more north of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, real, it's a real town. That, that they think the movie was. Yeah. yeah. There, so. um, All right, let's hit our birthdays because wow, top of the list. Um, a former uh, Monument winner, a former yeah. um, Axel Merrick's product. Uh, rider went over a race for the Higgins Action Berman team to kind of avoid being in the limelight too much as a big hope for Belgian um, Jasper Stoyven, 32 yeah. today. Yeah, it was, I mean, he's got so 7,000 points, which is a lot, you know, not, not, not a ton, ton of points, but, but a lot of points too. He's, he's always been super good rider, but not, um, you know, he won Milan San Remo. So, yeah. you know, he's yeah. definitely got some big ones. But, but well, maybe well, news Vlad Korn Bustle Kern, so he's won both the opening weekend yeah. and the overall the Deutschland tour. Yeah. Stage I of think the Walta. Some people feel like he's not won as much as he could have won, but he's always a threat to win, you know, which I think is yeah. his little trek, uh, you know, I mean, he's been with the, the, that team since 2016. So um I think he's he's always gives gives him another tool to play in in a lot of these things too. He's he's one of those guys that could win almost anything, even though he doesn't win maybe as much as what he could win. <laughs> yeah, no, he's a good solid rider. He was yeah. unfortunately involved in that crash, heavy crash with Walt Van Art and just recently. recent collarbone. Yeah. Yeah. So he's out for a little while. So yeah. Yeah. And an active racer. It's not very often we have the number one racer as being an active racer too. Well, Jade Wilk Wilcoxon. She's celebrating her 46th birthday. She raced for Optum back in the day. Is she American? American? American, yeah. National Championship, uh, the women's road race back in uh, 2013. Wow. Okay. It, it's always embarrassing when <laughs> someone's someone's uh, won a national championship and I don't remember them. So, um, yeah. All right. Same age as um, Jasper Stoyv and Brandon Fury. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, so Brandon Fury, he's national, crit national champion from two years ago. I rode with him at the One Love Century last year. Uh, so I wish him happy birthday actually today already. 
And he was wearing his Crit National Championship jersey, and I had my Grand Final National Championship jersey. So I, I sent him that picture of us wishing him a birthday, of us riding together, with, yeah, arm over shoulder. So he's a great guy. He's from Chicago, uh, Chicago land. He went to um, the school, the college in St. Louis. It was a really good collegiate program for a while. He's a great guy. Yep. And he was writing for Miami Blazers. So yeah, it's going to hurt him not having the NCL this year. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Brian Lark is 31. Another American celebrating a birthday just in his 30s. I think that's all I got for Americans on the list. Um, yeah, I think we're caught up for now. We'll uh, try to get we back together. We, I don't, yeah, we, oh, no, we did. Okay. I was just thinking, do we give Nia Doma her due for winning? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. We said the first time since 2019 and stuff, too. But also, too, I mean, so she's 29, I think she is 29. And um, Taylor Finney's girlfriend, I think, still, right? I don't know. I think so. I believe so. Yeah. 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 But, but she, she's she been aggressive at these races, and she... She's pushing it more this year. Yes. Yeah. And it was and, and it was an aggressive move to win today. So yeah, and Canyon Sram, another non SD Works winner, is always good for cycling. But if, strange enough, Demi Forlering is without a win yet this year. So she was right. That was her first win. Canyon Sram's Dem, first win. Demi Fullering is without oh. a win so far. Yeah. So she let that out, right? She was. Yeah. Yeah, she was second. Is she a second, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway. All right. And Maddox, right, Beck, Maddox Beck said, who was a former, you know, Perry Bay winner, too, Perry is the director, Bay, right. director of that team. So. All right. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Well, thanks, Randy, for making time. Um, enjoy your time there in Niles, our hometown with mom and dad. Yeah. And we'll talk to you again soon. And I'm doing Barry Bay this weekend with a bunch of my athletes and stuff, too. So a gravel race in Hastings, Michigan, which is evolved from, you know, a hundred guys getting together, 2000. Uh, nine, I think, was started to being like 5,000 people. It's the limit. It's the limit now. So it'd be a, it'd be a big, and so only cold day of the week. <laughs> so, which, so which in the day before gravel racing, there were, you know, some of these races that had dirt sections. If they didn't, they didn't have cobbles to ride over, but something to kind of mix up and give a Perry Roubaix kind of feel to it. Right. So, so it's called a Barry Roubaix, right? Yeah. Right. But it's mostly, yeah. I, I've heard yeah. when I did it before I did it on my cycle cross bike, now I'm doing it on a gravel bike. All right. Well, good luck. Have a great race, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right, Dean. Bye now. Bye.